Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. You know, our guests come from a great variety of backgrounds, paths. Though, as I've mentioned many times on The Journey Home, it's all the same fingerprints of the work of the Holy Spirit, but in so many different ways. So that's why it's always fascinating we hear somebody coming from a, a background that's not as expected, not the, not the usual suspects, as they might say, because our guest tonight is a former Muslim. Nikki Kingsley is uh, our guest, and uh, I want to just mention right off the bat that Nikki's website is NikkiKingsley.com, because she's going to mention a book that you can find on that about her journey. Nikki, welcome to The Journey Home. Great to be here, Marcus. Thank great. you. And it, looking forward so much to hearing your story, because I have a feeling it's not, as I said, not the usual suspects as, as we're used to hearing Anglicans and Baptists and the whole nine yards that are so similar. But you come from a wow, completely different paradigm shift. So let's hear how you started well, your journey. Well, it certainly was a big change. Um, so I was born in Pakistan and uh, in a Muslim family. And in Islam, there are two main sects. So there's yeah. the Shia and the Sunni sect. Mm -hmm. And I come from, a, from the Shia sect. Mm -hmm. And within that also, there are many uh, denominations. And I come from the most liberal sect of the Shia okay. branch. And um, I'm one of uh, three sisters. And um, when I was four years old, we moved to Africa. And uh, that's where I grew up. I did all my schooling there from, you know, kindergarten all the way to um, high school and attended the American school, the international schools wow. there. And um, life was wonderful. It was huh. simple in Africa. It, uh, we had A lots predominantly of... predominantly Muslim area? Um, no, not, um, not necessarily. We lived in different parts. We lived um, in Tanzania. And um, so there were a lot yeah. of Christians there. But we were raised in a very uh, sheltered home. Mm -hmm. Our uh, parents, very kind, very loving, taught us to be, you know, loving, kind to everybody. It was more about being a good person mm -hmm. than really practicing the prayers and the rituals of Islam. So my sister. Did you have a belief in, in God? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, right. we knew we were Muslim. Okay. And we knew that um, that's what we were born. That's what we're going to die. That's the way to be. But my parents didn't really focus so much on doing the prayers and reading the Quran. It was more about being kind to everybody, loving everybody, but knowing we're Muslim. And um, also the culture of Islam is a um, lot of respect for your parents. Yeah. And your parents are always right. You do, you know, you honor them, respect them. And uh, my sisters and I were raised that way. So whatever my parents said, is whatever was was right. Mm. And um, so we grew up in that way, n practicing Islam in a very open kind of way, uh, not so much as praying the namaz or doing mm. anything like that. And um, because life was so simple, we had no telephone, we had no TV, mm. uh, you know, but lots of friends. And so I started reading a lot. I would read a lot of books, and uh, that was really my window into the world. It helped me see the world through the books. And I, you know, I started with um, mysteries and graduated to romance novels <laughs> as I grew up. And um, I, you know, that was, that was the world I created in my mind. Uh, wow. And it was... Um, I mean, that's fascinating in itself to think of creating a world out of those books. Right, because <laughs> we didn't really see much more. Now, we did travel. We would go to Pakistan every year. We would go to, we came to America every year also to visit on vacation because we had family. And, but we were always happy to go back to Africa because that was home and life was just simple and, you know, we, we loved it there. And when I was 16, my parents arranged my marriage. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I didn't really object because that's how we that's were raised. Awesome. Yeah. You know, we were raised not to really think about a career or who we wanted to be but more of um, being a good wife and a good mother. And that was going to be, you know, but the that, mission. But that didn't, that didn't sound like it would have rung with your romance novels. No, but, <laughs> but you know, it kind of did because I, I imagined him to be this knight in shining armor. And, you know, I could 
knit whatever story I wanted. <laughs> and and because of the obedience part too, you know, it was that's how I was raised. So yeah. I didn't really object to it. Yeah. When I came, uh, this was when I was a sophomore in high school, when my marriage was arranged. Wow. And uh, when I was um, close to graduating high school is when I f started to feel like I want to go to college. I want to, <laughs> to explore who I can be. But I was told that that wasn't possible. And, you know. Because you're not married yet. No, yeah, no. That's too, yeah, that's arranged. That, that was going to yeah, come up gotcha. very soon. Yeah. And so when I, I you know, any amount of crying wasn't going to change that. So, you know, I went back to my romance novels and just, you know, dreamt of this knight in shining armor and what this uh, marriage was going to be. And um, so we went back to Pakistan and I was married and my parents flew back to Africa. And now I was in Pakistan, the country I was born in, but hadn't really lived in. Um, living with a new family because the culture is that you live with your in-laws. Uh, with your husband's yeah. parents, and he was Sunni, and I was Shia, and that's when I got my first no. culture shock. I was going to say that a lot of the audience are, are not going to visualize or feel for the radical difference between those two groups. Right. Yeah, yeah. so the Sunni um, are more... Um, you know, like the the Quran and yeah. Prophet Muhammad, and that is all that more they focus on. More fundamentalist, yeah. and and like I said, the Shias do too, of course. Yeah. You know, believe all that. But like I said, I came from a, a more different. liberal kind yeah. of branch, yeah. and I hadn't really practiced it, even though I believed with all my heart in Islam. And so I um, I went through a culture shock. You know, now uh -huh. my mother-in-law is praying five times a day. And they would look at me like, you know, what kind of a pagan was I, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so I, I started to learn very quickly, you know, how to pray and, you know, do the ritual cleansing and everything that is necessary. Unfortunately, my husband was not the knight in shining armor. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, that dream kind of shattered the day after my marriage. Oh. And... Um, so I turned to God desperately mm. at that point. And I thought, because in Islam, you know, you serve God. He is the master yeah. and you are this being on earth that you just beg him for mercy, forgiveness, and, and you worship him. And so I thought my only way out of this was going to be by prayer. If I could get Allah's mm. attention on me, he was going to save me because divorce was not an option. That would bring shame on my family. That was just not done. And I had two younger sisters who would marry them. And so I had to survive this. And I was 18 years old. I had my whole life ahead of me, and I was in a country where it was male-dominated. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started reading the Quran, and in the uh, Quran, there's a chapter dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And huh. when I came across that chapter, it's called Surah Maryam. Maryam is, you know, the name for Mary. I was just so drawn to this beautiful woman who was so holy and huh. so pious. And she's the only woman that has a chapter dedicated to her. And I was just so drawn to her. I fell in love with her. And I would read that chapter every single day. Hmm. And I was um, pregnant with my daughter at that time. And um, I just asked that my child would be as holy as this woman was. Hmm. And um, so, and I, of course, I was begging God to do a miracle and get me out of Pakistan so I could have, you know, some freedom. And so my daughter was born. And shortly after that, Allah heard my prayer and we moved to the Middle East. Uh, we mm. moved to the United Arab Emirates. Mm. And um, so that's where I lived for the next 10 years. My mm. son was born there and I was practicing Islam. Mm. And um, more so now, you know, the more, more the Sunni way, mm -hmm. because that's the family I had yeah. uh, been married into. And unfortunately, things weren't going well in my marriage. It didn't get any better, even though moving to the UAE was better because I had a little bit of freedom. I wasn't living with my in-laws. And so um, as things got worse with the marriage, and now I have two children, 
um, I got very depressed and uh, suicidal. It just mm -hmm. and started to affect my health. And through all this, I had been telling my parents I was unhappy. I, I didn't want to stay anymore. And they kept telling me, you have to grow up. Life mm -hmm. is a compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, they thought I just wasn't mature enough. Well, um, it got so bad and I was getting suicidal. So I did tell my dad about that one day uh, over the phone. And uh, that's when they took notice and they thought, oh. okay, this is serious. Yeah. And um, so my dad decided to help me and he sent me uh, money to buy a ticket for my kids and myself. And um, because I told him I wanted to come to America and I just felt in my heart that that was the one place, if I came to America, I would get freedom. Mm. And to me, it was like a city set up on a hill with a light shining on it. If I could just make it there, I'd be okay. And um, so my dad sent me some money and I planned to get away from there. I didn't tell my husband mm. I was leaving with plans of not coming back because I was afraid he would take the kids from me and I would be trapped and I would never be able to leave. So in a way, it was an escape from there. And I managed, um, mm. you know, it was stressful. I didn't know until the plane took off if I would really make it because mm. all he had to do was call the airport that she's leaving with my kids and they would have stopped me. Wow. And it's when I landed in New York that I could finally breathe because I sat on the whole flight holding both my kids close mm. to me. Um, and I had a daughter and I didn't want her to to have a go life, the same thing. Yeah, yeah, go through the same thing. I wanted her to have an opportunity to live mm -hmm. and have an education. So I arrived, I made it to the city, um, set up on a hill, and I landed <laughs> um, in the United States and with my two children. I had a couple hundred dollars and two kids, no work experience. I didn't know how to drive. How, were you very... Uh, good at English at that point? Well, I grew up speaking English because oh, okay. American schools and, you know, so so, that was a good so I could speak that. English, but, you know, I didn't understand the, di you know, I would, people would talk to me in English, but I didn't know what they were saying because they would make references to different things and I didn't grow up here, so I wouldn't understand anything. Especially if you land in New York, right? Right. At certain parts yeah. of New York, you can't understand what they're saying right. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was a challenge. And, you know, I came looking for freedom. But when I got the freedom, it was overwhelming. Yeah. Because I did want freedom, but it was too much. And so that was an adjustment, too. Our guest is Nikki Kingsley. Uh, you know, those of us who have lived in the United States our life probably can't even imagine what it would be like to come from not, not just a, a foreign country, but right. such a different culture into New York City. Yeah. 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 So. yeah did, did you get any help? Quite your family. Well, you I said had you had family some family here. here. Yeah, yes. Okay. And God bless them. They welcomed me in their home. And um, my uncle helped me find a job and he taught me how to drive. And my first job was in sales, and all it required was driving, and I didn't even have a driver's license. So, <laughs> but I had two children, and I had to make it. And um, you know, and the company that hired me sponsored me, and I, you know, went through the whole legal system of getting a visa and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started a new life. I got my first apartment, got my first car, mm -hmm. and um, got the kids in school, and. Um, you know, and slowly got, got on my feet and settled in. And throughout, God had been very important to me. You know, so my prayer life was, as a Muslim, I was very, very devoted to Allah. And I wanted to do everything to make sure He was pleased. When you, when you arrived here and you became acclimated, were, were you able to become involved in the Muslim community because of yes. because of what had happened in your decision? Yeah, because now I was in America, the thinking was a little bit different. Okay. So, right. you know, people were more accepting of that. Uh -huh. And it took me about two years to, to get a divorce. And, you know, and that's why I've written a book. There's so many details yeah. I couldn't even, you know, start <laughs> going into. But I finally was able to get a divorce. All my friends are Muslims which we would call mo moderate Muslims, you know, um, assimilated with the culture, peace-loving, 
you know, all that, but very devout Muslims. Mm -hmm. You know, we fasted in Ramadan, we prayed the uh, prayed five times a day, read the Quran, did everything, and made sure my kids had a Quran teacher. I wanted to make sure my children would not go astray, that I came to this country and I didn't want to lose the faith because mm -hmm. I, I believed in it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was doing everything I could. And what happened, Marcus, was I had been worshiping Allah and begging Him for 15 years to save me. And now that I was in America and I was kind of living a free and a normal life, I, my prayer changed. I, instead of just begging Him to save me, I started asking Him who He was. I wanted to know Him. I wasn't satisfied just doing the rituals mm. because I knew deep in my heart there was more, mm. and I knew I didn't have it. I knew there was more, mm. but I didn't have it yet, mm. and I wanted it at all cost. And truth was something that's been very, very important to me, even as a little girl, mm. talking to my parents, or if I hear a conversation, and if my parents said something, I'd be like, wait a minute, but that's not exactly true because so-and-so said it this way, and you just, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would just nitpick about truth. It ha And once I had that figure, then I was like, okay, now this conversation is fully true. So truth was just this driving force in my life about everything. Mm -hmm. And so when I started seeking God, I was seeking truth. And I knew there was more to Allah, and I didn't have it. So I would pray and I would be prostrate on the prayer mat for a long time, face down, crying out to Allah to reveal Himself to me. And I would get an, um, an image in my head and I would see a wall and I would see darkness and there would be silence. Mm -hmm. I got nothing back. I would look online looking for books to grow in my faith, to know, and I really I couldn't find anything other than um, the punishment in the grave, um, of course the Quran, which I was reading, the life of Muhammad, or poetry, but mm. nothing to help me grow in mm. spirituality. And so I was frustrated, so I just turned back to the Quran and I would read that and I would just pray and ask Allah for guidance, and um, I would hear nothing. So, um, I'm gonna interrupt because you're a, a, a Muslim. You had some Christian influence because in places where you sure. were, there was some American mm -hmm. influence. But then you land in the United States, and a lot of us think we're a Christian nation, right? But you land here, right? And you live for a couple years until you got. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, was our nation? Were we a good witness to you? Because it sounds like you weren't being lured away from your, your Muslim faith no. at all by what you found here. Well, you know, that was the one thing I've realized. Nobody witnessed to me. Nobody did. And I'd come here on vacation, but it's like in the quest to be so politically correct, we don't say the word of Jesus because we're trying to be understanding for the other, but in the process, we've become mute about the truth for yeah. what, you know, what yeah. drives us. And no, nobody did. And, but at the same time, my, um, all my friends were Muslim. I had not oh, one Christian. I made, I had created my own world within America hmm. that was comfortable. Yeah. And because Islam was such a big part of my life, culture, yeah. how we are as a family. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I was seeking, but I was hearing nothing. And I would tell my friends, all Muslim friends, when we would get together, and I would bring up these thoughts that, you know, I really want to know there is more to Allah. I want to, to know Him. And, I, and they would look at me like I'm, a, I'm crazy and say, what more do you want? You're praying, you're fasting, you're, what more do you want? And at mm. this point, I'm more religious than my parents are, you know, <laughs> practicing. And I said, but there's more. I want, I want to know Him. I, what I was mm. seeking was a relationship. Yep. I just didn't yep. know that. So anyway, um, I um, went into St. Patrick's Cathedral, 
one day, and this was just a trip advisor, you know, thing. It wasn't like I was seeking anything more. I had never researched uh, Christianity. I had no interest in anything but Islam. So I was seeking Allah in the Islamic box. I had strict boundaries where I was going to find my answers. So I walked into St. Patrick's Cathedral just, you know, um, to look at it like a tourist. And I walked in, and the first thing that hit me, there was a stained glass picture, uh, you know, of Jesus that was kind of suspended. And I saw his face, and it's like his eyes were alive, and they just looked right into me. And it made me very uncomfortable. And so I walked around, and part of me was feeling like I was sinning, because in Islam, you don't have okay. idols. I had just stepped into a church, and you know, so I was going through a lot of turmoil within. And now I felt this Jesus was following me. And St. Patrick's Cathedral is magnificent. Yeah. It was just so beautiful. And I just walked around admiring it, but afraid at the same mm -hmm. time. And Jesus following me. <laughs> and so I walked around, admired everything, and near the exit is the little gift shop. So I stopped there, the kids were with me, and all of a sudden I heard a woman's voice in my ear, my left ear, the most sweetest voice, and she said, come back, come back. And I looked and there was nobody there. And I'm thinking, okay, this is not happening, so I ignored it. <laughs> And then again, that whisper, and then I knew it was Mary. Hmm. And standing in there, I didn't think Mariam, that the word was Mary, it's her. And I had loved her as hmm. a Muslim. And so I couldn't just ignore her and walk out. And when the words came, come back, was she, she told me exactly where. She was calling me to her chapel at the back of um, St. Patrick's. Hmm. She was calling me to her chapel. And so I went back because I couldn't ignore her. Yeah, I loved her so much. And so I went into her chapel and I stood there because I wasn't gonna kneel, I'm a Muslim. Yeah. And I stood and I asked her, what do you want? And I heard nothing, but I felt such a peace. And you know, I came back there, I was there um, in New York City for like three days Every day, I had to come back to the chapel. To the chapel. I felt I couldn't, I could not, uh, you know, I had to go there and just get that peace. A lot of viewers may not realize that within Muslim, Jesus is a part of the story, yes. but a different understanding of yes. Jesus. So Jesus is a prophet, the mother of um, the Virgin Mary, Mariam. The, the son of the Yes, the, the son of the Virgin Mary. And he is um, human, fully human. He had the gift of healing, and he was born, and he died. And he, you know, he'll come at the end of time. But there is no uh, divinity linked to him at all. He is a prophet with the gift of healing. So seeing the, the, the portrait of of Jesus mm -hmm. and, and sensing his eyes right. didn't really be a, a break from a Muslim background. No, right? there's something it, special about him. Right. But it it unsettled me yeah. because it felt like he was alive, okay. you know, is yeah. what, what got me. And, you know, in Islam, it is a, a virgin birth. Yeah. So that is accepted. And, um, but, but at couldn't this, get away from Our Lady. No, but it was her who yeah. was more close to me at that, you know, I didn't really feel Jesus, but it was, uh, or the prophet Isa, but it was more Mariam, you know, <laughs> Mary. And, and because it was her who called me, I couldn't turn away. And so I did that, um, you know, went back for the next few days, heard nothing more, nothing else happened. And I, I just, you know, life went on back to normal. Mm. And I just thought, well, you know, Mariam, I loved her and, you know, just a nice experience. And that was it. And life went on. I fasted. Ramadan came and everything. This was in the springtime when I was in uh, at St. Patrick. And then it was December. Mm -hmm. And the first week of December comes around and I was asleep. And, um, you know, when you are deep asleep and somebody gently kind of shakes you and you're kind of between the sleeping and mm -hmm. the waking, that's the kind of 
um, I felt somebody kind of just shook me a little and I kind of was half awake. I could tell the sun was just rising and uh, Jesus and Mary were at my bedside. <laughs> and um, wow. it, was, it was just beyond words. It was like heaven had come into the room. Hmm. And, um, and they prayed with me. And we discussed my whole life from the moment, even before my conception. Hmm. It's like it, we had had this discussion of what my life was going to be in heaven. And now they were reminding me. And, and, and the joy that filled my heart, it's like my spirit was dancing. Hmm. And my body, I knew, was still on the bed, but my spirit was not. And I, I was dancing, embracing, and uh, we prayed. And as this was happening, a light was being infused into me. Mm-hmm. And when I woke up that morning, I was no longer the same person. Mm-hmm. I, I was changed. And that I knew deep in me, but in my head started this struggle of what that can't be, that must have been a dream, but it was like, I knew it wasn't, but I physically had experienced this. And, um, and then I felt a presence come over me from the day after, and it was God, mm-hmm. it was holy. I knew that, but in my head, I couldn't fit it in my Muslim box. That's what I was, was in my mind, I was like, well, did you, did, as they would say, did you have the right file folders in there to no, put it in? No, where you... I had no labeled folders. All I had was Islam, and everything had to go in there. And I didn't know where to put this. And um, But the presence that came over me was like a bubble, and it was with me all the time. And I'd lived in the same house for a few years now, driven down the same road to go to work. I had no idea how many churches were on that road because I was blind. I didn't want to, I didn't care. And all I could see after that, I noticed every church and I noticed every cross that was on that street. (laughs) And I'm looking and thinking, I had no idea. Like, I truly was blind, but now I could see. So definitely, again, the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit touching you. Why don't we take our break now, because I want you to have time to come back and expand on that a little bit, because we want to rush you with the break. (laughs) So we'll pause just a second. Nikki, and again, I want to remind you that Nikki has a website, NikkiKingsley.com, or if you go there, you can get connected with her book, which gives a more detailed expression of her story. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Nikki Kin- Kingsley. Kingsley. Uh, I interrupted you. You were right telling us something <laughs> really, really significant, and that is all, you're, you're down this, you're walking down the street, you've walked through a hundred times, so that old song from, from um, uh, you know, I've walked the street, you know, uh, but all of a sudden you're seeing things right. that had always been there, but you never saw them before. Yeah, I'd lived in the sa- on the same street for years now, and I would drive the same way to work, and I had never noticed how many churches were on that street. And as I'm driving, my attention would be drawn, I would see the church, and I would see the cross. Mm-hmm. And it's like this light would shine on the cross. And, you know, it's like, how could I have not noticed all these churches? Mm-hmm. Or if I went into a store and if there was a Bible in the store or anything that was related to Christianity, it's my attention would be taken, Mm. I would notice it, Mm. it would be like a light shining on it, and Mm. the voice would say, look. And I couldn't get away from it. It was (laughs) constant. And now, you know, you have to remember, I'm in in my Muslim mindset, and to me, this is very scary because you know, I, I have no desire to be anything but a Muslim, and mm. why is my attention being taken to these Christian symbols? I didn't want it. Mm. So I started to go through a struggle within my mind, and I started to have um, dreams and visions after that, 
And every dream, every vision, every um, interior voice, everything was Christian related. It would be Jesus, it would be Mary. And it had nothing to do with Islam. And it really scared me. And then I got angry. I got angry with God because I thought, Allah, I have been praying for all this time, prostrate hours, praying to you, asking to reveal yourself to me, draw me closer to you. And now you send me Jesus and Mary. Why didn't you send me Muhammad? Because that would make sense to me that you are answering my prayer. But I knew it was God who was doing that. Like, I didn't question that. I could feel God's presence. But it didn't make sense to me that why I would, and I was afraid because I believed Christians um, were going to go to hell because they believed yeah. in a son of God. And God, Allah had, was the only one, you know, they, he had no children, he was not begotten. And now I'm seeing this Jesus. And it, it started to really scare me. And the Jesus that would come to me and I would feel his presence and it would show up in a dream was not a man. There was power that came from him, and there was authority that came from him. He was not like, a, you know, Prophet Isa, that's, you know, as a Muslim, mm -hmm. I believe, who had died, and now I'm seeing him in a dream. It, it was not that. He was alive. Mm -hmm. I could feel he was alive, and there was an authority that he came with. And, um, and I remember in one dream, the love that came out of him was so intense that in my dream I was, I was dying because I could barely take the love. It was all centered on love. And I couldn't deny that he was more than a person. And there, there was my struggle as a Muslim. Now, I refuse to research Christianity on the internet because I don't want to feed into what's happening. I, I was trying to reject it. I didn't want to research it. I didn't want to read the Bible because I was scared if I got into it where it would take me. So I was rejecting everything I could. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to, this was going to be between me and God. There was going to be nobody's research, nothing. So I didn't do anything. And this continued with me for a year and a half. Wow. And I was taken down this road where, um, and, and when Mary would call me and I would, you know, she would ask me to go to a certain place that was Christian, of course, and one was like an outdoor shrine. And I parked my car. I was so angry because I'd had enough of these dreams and visions. I wanted these to stop so I could go back to my Muslim world. I was getting exhausted. And I remember coming, you know, getting out of the car, slamming the door shut, and there was a statue of Mary, and I stood in front of her and said, what do you want from me? Why are you doing this to me? And I physically felt these hands on me, turning me to the other side. And when I looked there, there was the statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And when I looked at him, I couldn't stop looking at him. Mm. I thought I was going to melt. All I could feel was love. So when I asked her, what do you want? She turned me to her son. And I started to go to that outdoor shrine every day. And I wouldn't go to her anymore. I was going to the statue of Jesus. I'd spent hours there. And all I would, you know, I was trying to reject him, but I couldn't leave him either. There was this draw to him. And this continued long story again and finally I, i'm curious the it isn't just jesus it's jesus with the sacred heart yes. and i'm wondering how you well i didn't know what that meant today um, i can tell you it was right. a sacred heart but, <laughs> but at the time but at that time it was just jesus pointing to his heart okay. and in my like i said in my you know i've had dreams where the love is so intense i could just die mm. so he's pointing to his heart and all i could feel was love mm. and so um it there was a lady who I knew at work, and she was the only one I started to share what was happening, these dreams and visions. And she just looked at me and said, oh my gosh, you are so blessed. You need to come to my church. So now she's you, Christian, this oh, okay. late lady you, you at work. Yeah, no, okay. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know okay. denominations. I could care less. I just <laughs> knew she was Christian. I was yeah. telling her what was happening to me. 
And she said, you have to come to my church. You are so blessed. I said, I don't want to go to a church. Why would I go to a church? I'm trying to get away from this. <laughs> and so, but you know, it, it continued so much and it came where it was December, it was Christmas time. And I had gotten to a point where I wanted an answer from Jesus and I wanted to be done. And I said, okay, I will go to a church. I didn't tell my friend because I didn't want pressure. I thought I'll go to a church on my own for Christmas and I am going to ask Jesus, because the church is his home, what he wants from me, and I want to be done with this. And so I went to a Christmas midnight service to a church down the road from my house. To me, a church was a church. I didn't know mm -hmm. denomination. Um, and it was a Christian church. And I, I went in, and there was a, you know, a service. And the uh, pastor did the reading. They passed a tray around with you know, little cops, and I, I participated in everything. And I was waiting for, because Jesus was going to tell me what he wants from me. That was my deal for coming in the church. <laughs> and it ended, and we processed out with candles singing. And it was a beautiful service. I could feel the love. It was wonderful. People were welcoming. And I had taken this big step for Jesus. And I came out, and I was so disappointed because he wasn't there. I felt this emptiness in my heart because I knew what his presence would feel like. Mm -hmm. I, it's how I don't, I just knew. And I walked out thinking, Jesus, you're not even in your own church. Like, mm -hmm. that's how it felt. You weren't there. And I came looking for you for an answer. So now where am I going to go? I haven't, I, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do because I want to end this. You know, I want a closure to this. So I told my friend, I said, you know, I went to a church and there was, wasn't there. And she said, she asked me where, and I told her, and she said, just please come to my church. And I said, Debbie, what difference does it make what church I go to? A church is a church. She said, no, just please come to my church. And I was desperate. I said, okay, I'll come to your church, but I'm not doing a service again and spending all this time there. I, you know, just take me when no one's there. I'll know if... He's really there, and then, you know, so let's not waste time. So one morning, I go with her on a weekday, um, like, you know, walk in, nobody's there. I took my first step in. It was a Catholic church, and to me, what's a Catholic church? It's just a church, right? <laughs> and I took my first step in, and I took a breath, and I said, He lives here. I can feel Him. Mm. I felt physically His presence. And I had no idea the difference between the other church and this church was just a church. And I just sat down. I'm like, okay, I finally found your home. Now you're going to tell me what you want from me. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? And from that day, I started going to that Catholic church every day when no one was there. And I would sit in the back pew alone, and I would argue with the crucifix. And I would tell him, Every day, every day I was there, um, you're not the Son of God, because there is no Son of God. What do you want from me? Why are you doing this to me? Oh, I, I would be angry. I would say it all. <laughs> and when I was done with my angry rant, and then I would tell him about my day, and I would tell him about, you know, what I was going through with the kids. My daughter is a teenager now, my struggles with everything. <laughs> and I would leave, and I'd show up the next day and do the same thing and tell him, you know, he's not the son of God. And I did this for months. The worst, the day I least cared for was Sunday, because Sunday I couldn't go because they had people in the church. Mm. So I couldn't wait for Monday so I could go and be alone with him and do my, you know, angry thing and then spend time with him. And I'd walk out at peace and I'd show up the next day wanting, telling him he can't be the son of God. And so this went on for months, and finally, one day, God had had enough, I think, of me. <laughs> and I walked in, sat down, did the same thing, last pew. And that day, I heard the audible voice of God echo in that church. I heard it with my ears. And he said to me, who are you to tell me who I can be and cannot be? <laughs> if you really want to know the truth, go and come back like a child, and I will tell you the truth. Sounds like he was talking to Job. <laughs> <laughs>
You know what I mean? Who yes. Are you? <laughs> yes. And you know, it's true. Who was I to say, you know, God, you can't have a son because because what? He, if he's God, who was I to say that? Because that's what I'd grown up knowing, but I couldn't tell God that. And he gave me a choice. If you want the truth, it was an invitation. There was no compulsion. There was no force. It mm. was freedom. If you want the truth, then you can come back like a child, which is willing to listen instead of telling him. And he gave me a promise. I will tell you the truth. And so I went back. Of course, I had to. And um, I sat down and I emptied my mind. I had to. I had to know the truth. Mm. He had taken me on this journey. And I sat down and I said, tell me. And I emptied my mind. And I was 40 years old. I had mm. to empty it of everything I had learned as a Muslim, my fears, everything. And when I did that, a bolt of light came from that crucifix. And it hit my heart. It went through my body. And I shook. And... I collapsed on my knees mm. because Jesus was right in front of me and I knew everything and all I could sob out was, I believe, I believe you are mm. the Son of God. Mm. I believe because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend mm. and every tongue proclaim that he is Lord mm. to the glory of God the Father. And when he stood in front of me, there was not a question. It wasn't a philosophy of truth. It wasn't an ideology. He is the truth. Hmm. I was thinking that you had said earlier that you didn't go to the internet, you didn't do this. No. Nope. And on the one hand, we're saying, well, where'd you get this information from? But in some ways, you were you were protected from all the gazillion yes, voices and, of right. all the things. I am so thankful for that because this was just coming straight from him. Yeah. And there was so much love that came. And when I accepted Jesus in that moment on my knees, crying, that wall that I would see as a Muslim that was always before me came crashing down mm -hmm. in front of my eyes and behind the wall was God the Father. Mm -hmm. And I met him and his love for me. And it was so powerful. I thought I was going to fall over with the love, the waves of love. And he said, I have waited so long for you. Mm. And I met my father in mm. heaven, but I could only your, do it. Not father, but your, what do you say in your? My Baba. Yeah, I call him my Baba. In your language. Then, right? Yes. That's the word that always rises up when I think of him as Baba. Mm. And, but I couldn't meet the father without the son, mm -hmm. because it's only through the son that I came into relationship. I knew God before, I loved God before, but it's like living outside the castle and the king is in the castle. And the only way in, I could live as a slave on the outside and still love the king, or I could come inside, be adopted as his daughter. The only way in was through the sun. The sun stands at the doorway mm -hmm. to the castle and is there to welcome us if you want a relationship yeah. with Baba. Mm -hmm. Or we can stay outside and worship God, but never have a relationship. So you have this unbelievable, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but, you know, unexpected, yes. you know, encounter with the Lord. So there you are in the church and that's safe, but you got to go back to reality. Yes, <laughs> I did. And that was the hard part. I was going to hurt my parents and I knew I couldn't live a, a fake life. I couldn't live as a Muslim and worship Christ. Jesus as my Lord, because yeah. that's who he was. He showed me that. And at this point, all you have is what you've been infused yes. into. You don't have any catechism. Nothing. Right. Right. And, uh, and I decided I had to become a Catholic. And of course, I had to tell my parents. And they said, well, you can, you can go to church. They could see there's, that I wasn't just going to change my mind. And they said, well, but do you really have to convert? Don't convert. Just go. That's fine. And I said, I have found the truth. And I will live the truth now because he came to set us free in the truth. And those who will deny me, I'll deny is what he says. And I've read all this after. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. It's, but when I read the Bible, it's like, I know this. 
because he's shown this to me. It was a familiar voice when you read the Bible? Yeah, it was the, <laughs> when I was looking, reading love stories and mysteries, Marcus, I had no idea. The greatest love story hmm. is with God the Father, with Jesus, that he died for us out of love. There is no greater love story that has ever been written than that. Mm -hmm. And there is no greater mystery because faith is not something that you put in, in your mind and, you know, you understand. You have to accept it's a mystery and you have to live in that mystery every day. The greatest love story and mystery. So when you, uh, you're talking about our Lord being the, the gatekeeper, if you will, breaking it into, the, into Baba the Father, mm -hmm. But you had had this relationship with Our Lady for so long. Oh, yes. Where was she now in this, at oh, this time for you? Oh, my goodness. She has always, she's been there. Whenever I feel a little lost or anything, she shows up. But then she sends me back to her son. <laughs> she is, she, her biggest desire is that for her children, all children, to know her son. And through knowing her son, come into relationship with God the Father. And that's how, what she's done with me my whole journey. Even before I knew Jesus, she was there. Yeah. And that is what she desires. And I've also been shown, again, that my stuff is all mystical in visions, that Our Lady loves the Muslim people. Mm -hmm. I have seen it. Mm -hmm. She has such a love. She's their mother, too. And she longs for them to experience the love of, of her son and mm -hmm. the father. And Jesus, too, he loves the Muslim. You know, Jesus said, I, I desire, Father, that um, they're all one, just as mm -hmm. you and I are one. And it's not just one within the Christian faith, one as all. You know, it's like a father who wants all his children at the table with him. No matter where they've been, they're welcome to come to the table. I'm admittedly not a great scholar on Fatima, but mm -hmm. it seems that what I've heard about that, that just the reality yes. of Fatima was a movement by our Lord to, to open the doors for this yes. movement of unity. I personally believe that the, the conversion that is going to come with the Muslim people is going to be through the love of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. Because Archbishop Fulton Sheen has said that those who love Our Lady so much will one day come to know her son. Because if you love her, she will put your hand in her son's hand and and you will enter into yeah. that greatest love story. You obviously received an awful lot of information in, in your infused experience, mm -hmm. but you, you've come to know the faith extremely oh, well. Yeah. How did you go from there, you know, to... Oh my goodness, I, I couldn't, I was looking up different, um, you know, saints, you know, and their conversions and their stories, and I just couldn't get enough because as a Muslim, I was thirsting for that. Yeah. And in the Catholic Church, I have found so much that has helped me grow. And just these, and I think the saints have touched me the most because they, are, they showed it by the way they lived their mm -hmm. life. And the Eucharist, oh my goodness, how did I know as a Muslim walking in? Is there any, you know, like from Judaism to the Christianity, there's a connection, Passover to the Eucharist. Is there any connection from Muslim to the Eucharist? No, you know what I'm saying? No, it, it, nothing. no I, not that I know yeah. or understand. No. no, I didn't know. And then I started attending Mass and... It's been 12 years now, and this is what I, whenever, you know, I tell myself, it's been 12 years, and, you know, we can, as human beings, we can get bored very quickly with the repetitive same <laughs> thing. 12 years later, I have more thirst for <laughs> communion with Jesus. <laughs> it just can't be a piece of bread to keep us coming back for more, for more, and that desire and that longing to be one with Him. And in my head, when the priest elevates the host, I'm like, really? That's you, Jesus? How can that be? But I submit to the mystery because I know the fruit it has borne in my life. You mentioned that your your parents were at least, you know, giving you a nudge to move forward. Right. What about your daughters and your other family members? Have they responded to you? Yeah, both my children are have come into the Catholic Church out of their own free will. And uh, one of my sisters has had her own mystical experience with the Lord two years after me, and she came into the Catholic Church. Um, there have been other family members who have had 
these experiences with Jesus that started. So mm. it's like, you know, I thought, okay, I came into the church and I thought that was it. But Jesus has such a big plan, you know, so much bigger than what yeah. we can even imagine. It's for salvation of the whole world. You know, it fascinates me. Uh, and Nikki, I, I had a, the privilege of doing a number of interviews with former Muslims. And it, it's interesting that often the journeys of Muslims involve more of the mystical side. Yes. And that's interesting to me. It, it, is that the Muslim background that make, allows you or, or encourage you to take dreams more seriously that open you up? Or, well, any idea on you know, that? I thought about that. And I think because, like, in, and I think that is in general with Islam, there's a lot of fear because nobody wants to go to hell. And Muslims mm. also trying to, you know, please God yeah. because that's what I was trying to do. And there was no place for, I wasn't willing to listen to anybody's argument because even doing that, I'm afraid mm. of going to hell because I'm entertaining that yeah. conversation. And I think Jesus has t had to by step that. He had to just like, okay, let's put your brain on the side and I'm gonna uh -huh. speak to you in a much deeper way. Uh -huh. And we encounter him and you can't deny an encounter. You can argue away stuff in your head, yeah. but you can't deny personal encounter. You know, in the psalm it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. You have to taste it. You put a steak in front of somebody and describe it. You don't know yeah. what it tastes like until you take a bite. And our Lord does say, by their fruit you will know them. Yes. So whether it's an intellectual conversion yes. or whether it's a mystical conversion, still the end result is, does it make a difference in your life? Right. Uh, you, you have to live it. Yeah. You have to live it. And I can tell you, I've suffered a lot since my conversion, trial mm. after trial, but I have fallen more in love with Jesus because of that, because he's shown me he's faithful. Yeah. Oh, uh, what, I mean, you've been gifted by grace to open your heart to so many things of the faith. What was the hardest thing, even after all of that, as you come into the church, what was the hardest barrier for to continue working on? You know, the the beauty of it is I have had no barrier with the Catholic oh, Church, none. No yeah. matter when, even when the scandals were happening, I, it yeah. it didn't make a difference to me because I knew the true Church is still the rock. Mm. But the biggest barrier to Christianity, I mean, that's where I struggled the most, was accepting the divinity of Christ. Yeah. I mean, that was the hardest thing for me. And then not only that, there's a trinity. Now there's three, yeah. you know, so <laughs> that, that was the biggest struggle for me. Yeah, you talked about the Father and our Son and our yes. Lady, but the Holy Spirit wasn't kind of mentioned in that, that initial journey, but, but, yeah. but He was the one making it happen. Absolutely. <laughs> when I felt, you know, the shaking and the power over me and all those, that's the Holy Spirit. I just didn't know the names at that point. Well, I often end the program by inviting you to speak to a potential Muslim sitting yes. right out there. Well, let's say that right now just happened in a hotel room, a Muslim turned on this program and is watching you and yes. you know doesn't have the file folders. Right. What would you right. say to that? Well, I would tell them that um, open the box and seek the truth, because once you have the truth, you, everything else will work out because you will encounter a peace like you have never had before. So just get down on your knees and ask for the truth without any boundaries, because God is way bigger than us and he can't be put into a box. And if you seek, you will find. If you ask for the truth, you will get it. But the only requirement is you have to lay down your boundaries. Put that folder yeah. aside. Yeah. Well, not everyone will be granted the gift of, of, the, uh, of the spiritual side you have. But Newman made a statement about to become deep in history as a cease to be Protestant. Would you say that's true for Muslims too? Uh, say that again? To, cease, to, to become deep in history right. is to cease to be Protestant. Would you say that by coming deeper in history also for a Muslim would draw them to see the reality of the truth of history help them see the reality of Christianity. Yes, I think possibly, but I really think that God will speak to each person to their heart. And I think if you open your heart and maybe even to walk into a church when no one is there and ask, 
it, are you really, because that's what I did, mm -hmm. I argued mm -hmm. with him, and don't be afraid to tell God your fears. Mm -hmm. He won't strike you with lightning. He is so loving, and he wants a relationship with each person as a father. All right, Nikki, thank you very much. Thank you for joining thank us you. on The Journey Home. And your Pleasure website, again, is Nick, Nikki King, Kingsley, Kingsley, Nikki Kingsley com. And if a person goes to that, they'll find out more about your book and other things that you're doing. Sure. All right, thank you. Thank, and thank you. you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Nikki's journey and her reality of a relationship with Jesus Christ and his church is an encouragement to you. God bless you.